In today's show, I take a look at the preseason and what sort of things we can take away so far. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. As I said, we are looking at the preseason. So I'm recording this before Saturday's games. So just some, yeah, I guess, observations, um, injury updates, rotation notes, big performers, and, and what that might mean for the upcoming fantasy season. So let's start talking about that right now. All right, lineup notes. Um, Al Horford looks like he's going to start next to Rob Williams in Boston. They're, that's that, They're starting that lineup today with Tatum at the three, and actually Romeo Langford's replacing Jalen Brown at the two. So it is looking that they're going to go that direction and not start Josh Richardson, not start Aaron Neesmith, not start Peyton Pritchard, not start Dennis Schroeder. They're going to go with Horford Williams. Overall, that helps the value of both of those guys. Um, I think it yeah, pushes Williams probably probably a top 50, maybe top 40. Horford, I think, is going to get underrated significantly. He becomes an interesting option. But it does look like that is the direction that they are headed um, for their starting lineup, at least to begin the season. That could change, and that's just sort of a gut feel. In Charlotte, it, it, again, this is not guaranteed, but it does feel like Miles Bridges will be the starting power forward and PJ Washington Jr. will come off the bench and be the backup four and the backup five. We haven't seen Plumlee because he's been dealing with health and safety protocols. So they have started Washington at the five, but I believe it'll be Bridges and... Uh, it looks like it'll be Bridges and Plumlee as the starters with Washington coming off the bench. Of course, that could change. That doesn't really change a huge amount from the fantasy value of Plumlee or Bridges or Washington. That's sort of what we've expected for the last few weeks anyway. So that Bridges, Washington still in that 80, 85 to 100, 105 sort of range for those guys is fine. And even Plumlee in that similar type area for, for Charlotte, I think looks, uh, looks to be a pretty good scenario. It also appears that in Cleveland, Evan Mobley is locked in as a starter. It doesn't appear that they'll be going with Larry Markinen or Kevin Love starting next to Jared Allen. So it looks like they've started in all preseason games, Mobley and Allen together. It appears that they will continue to go with that uh, through the regular season. That's just the way that it's looking at the moment. So I think that helps solidify Mobley's value. He's looked, I think, pretty good out there. Um, you know, his ADP is rough at like 80 or 84, whatever it is. I wouldn't want to take him there. But in the 100s, 101, 102, maybe 103 even. Around that sort of area, I think he's probably right. And this does help him. It obviously hurts marketing because it means that he's not going to push to 30 minutes. And he just needs a lot of shots and a lot of minutes to actually be fantasy relevant. I would be really hesitant to use anything more than a last pick on Lowry marketing at this stage if they're not going to start him and he's going to play that reserve role. They are playing him some at the three. They have no backup wings whatsoever. So maybe there's scope for him to get to 27 minutes, but even in 27 minutes, his game's just not diversified enough to have that sort of impact. He just needs a lot of shots and a lot of minutes to get there. It doesn't look like the Rockets are going to be um, using Jay Sean Tate as a starter. Eric Gordon started one of the games. Daniel House started the other. Now House looks shit house in that role. Maybe they put Tate there, but everything is sort of pushing against that at this point. At this point, that does probably knock a little bit off his value, maybe a minute or two. I thought he could have been a 31-minute-a-night guy as a starter. As a bench guy, it's probably more 29. And while that's not a huge difference, I think it's enough to at least have um, some sort of impact on his overall fantasy value for this year. So he's still fine as a later pick, but coming off the bench does hurt there somewhat. And in LA, it was going to be Trevor Ariza starting. It just appears now that it will be Kent Bazemore who moves into that starting small forward spot. The other interesting thing there is the play of Malik Monk. Now, there was a legitimate argument that Monk wouldn't even be a rotation guy for this team, but 
Yeah. They're, they've got 12 rotation caliber players, and Monk was probably the 11th or 12th of those guys. But he's been so good in preseason that I think there's a chance he could actually jump up, start in place of Wayne Ellington, and Ellington moves out of the rotation. I guess the absence of Ariza does help. And it's going to put Monk in the rotation regardless. But I think there's a chance that his role actually gets a little bit bigger. But, you know, when you've got Westbrook, LeBron, Ariza, Davis, um, Horton Tucker, Bazemore, Howard, Gar Camelo, Anthony, Kendrick Nunn, yeah, there's pro- one spot there between Allington and Monk as to who gets that last rotation spot. And it was always leaning towards Allington. I reckon it might be moving just a little bit towards... Um, towards being um, Malik Monk in that role there as well. This doesn't mean that we, uh, we're we not coming in and drafting uh, Monk or we're not drafting Kent Bazemore, despite you know what, what I've you know, put here as, as options that they can, um, or that, that might be there for the, the lineup. But that is just something to watch with how the Lakers uh, decide to line up on opening night with the uh, Trevor Ariza not going to be there. If you are looking to start a fantasy league, especially if you're looking to bring people in who've never played fantasy before, maybe give Sleeper a try. It is a points-only format, and they have their own, only use their exclusive game pick format where you pick one game for each player for the week. That's it. You don't worry about... There's no streaming. There's no, this guy plays three games. It is only one game for the week. So you might have to get lucky in trying to pick which game is going to be the best one for that player during the week. But it is more akin to fantasy football. So bringing casual fantasy basketball fans into a league, if they're familiar with fantasy football and only use points formats, then Sleeper might be the app for them. Or for you as well to start that league. Great interface, really easy to use, draft room, keeper, dynasty, redraft formats, third round reversal on their drafts as well. Everything looks really, really slick, and it's a very simplified format. So if you're looking to start new leagues and bring new people into fantasy basketball, Sleeper might be the app that you are looking for. All right, let's go back to look at some more lineup notes. In Memphis, it appears that Kyle Anderson will come off the bench, and Desmond Bain will... um, will start. I don't think that I don't think that Bain was very good there. I feel like I, I had a better Desmond Bain that I could have thrown in there. Desmond Bain. That's better. Um Desmond Bain looks like he will be the starter. They have been starting DeAnthony Melton, the wave pool, and Desmond Bain. And of course that's made me want to tip this desk over without using my hands. But Dylan Brooks has been out. And I think that Brooks will start and Bain will start. But there is a chance that they start Melton and Brooks together. I don't think they will. But I think it'll be Bain and Brooks with Melton getting 25 or so minutes off the bench. Now, this takes Anderson away from being a top 100 player in my mind. Um, you know, in late rounds, sure. I think he's probably going to be equivalent to a DeAnthony Melton now, who becomes a really interesting later round guy, as does Desmond Bain. But it does change things up there in Memphis. It also looks like Malik Beasley won't be starting in Minnesota. Nothing confirmed, of course. But they've gone with Josh Kogi as a starter in one game. They started Jaden McDaniels and Jared Vanderbilt together. I actually hate that combination. It doesn't make any sense to me to pay, play Jaden at the three. Um, but that's what they've gone with. And I just think that it never made a ton of sense apart from, well, he's one of the best five players, Malik, so we probably should start him. Just in terms of fit, as having another guy who's a poor defender who needs a lot of shots to play alongside Edwards, Russell, and Towns didn't make any sense. Getting some defense out there in the case of Akogi, getting some rebounding out there in the case of Vanderbilt alongside Jaden McDaniels, it makes more sense than throwing another scorer out when Beasley can come and play 27-28 off the bench. You sub in for Russell, sub in for Edwards. Um, you come in for those lineups occasionally for all offense as well. makes more sense. It does hurt Beasley's value. I wasn't as high on him as others were, but if you're looking for a scoring and three-point burst towards the end of a draft, it's still fine. It doesn't mean that we're drafting Vanderbilt. It doesn't mean that we're drafting Akogi. Jaden McDaniels, there's just not enough touches for that guy to go around to be anything more than a, the later round guy. We're not looking at him inside the top 100 or anything like that. The Pelicans lineup is one that's bringing me big confusion because I just don't know what to make of it, mainly because Zion's not playing, so we don't know how that's all fitting. Brandon Ingram actually sat out the last game, but I'll tell you who's looked terrible, Devontae Graham. He's just shit house. He cannot hit shots. He's one of the worst two-point shooters and finishers in the NBA, and the field goal percentage has been rough again. If I was the Pelicans, and I just put this out today in a tweet and over on Instagram, I'd just go with Nikhil Alexander-Walker, even though I don't really think he's much of a point guard, but i just have Nikhil Alexander-Walker and Trey Murphy there as the starters because Ingram handles the ball, can run as a point guard. Zion can run as a point guard. Alexander-Walker can run uh, for times as well. 
That's how I would look to do it. But they could very easily decide to go with um, Graham and Alexander Walker, Graham and Marshall, Graham and Trey Murphy. So there's a lot of confusion in that lineup. But I think that there is a chance. And you know, three weeks ago, I would have said Graham is definitely starting. Now I think that it's not so certain. And guys like Murphy and Alexander Walker have looked clearly better than him so far. That doesn't mean that they will be better all season, but that's how it's looked. So I am knocking Graham down a little bit as well. Doc Rivers doesn't seem to think that yeah, Maxi, Tyrese Maxi is going to guarantee himself the starting point guard job. It's still a competition between him and Shake Milton, which is insane to me. I just don't think Milton is a... Look, literally, Milton should not have been in the rotation if Simmons was playing. Um, I don't think he's really a point guard. Yeah, Maxi, might, you might say, is not really a point guard either, but he's better than Milton. And I would you say that Isaiah Joe's even played at a higher level than Shake Milton has so far in the preseason. So to think that they would go in with Shake Milton as their starting point guard would be infuriatingly insane to me. But it means you need to drop a little bit back on Maxi there um, in terms of where the value sits. You know, maybe 110s, 120s. Um, if you miss out on him, again, this is not the end of the world when people go, I've got to get this guy. I have to get him. Got to make sure I get Tyrese Maxi. But if people start reaching up to 90, you just let him have him. You, you let him have him. Like, you just go, all right, that's fine. Take him, and, and then let's see what happens. Because if he does play 27 minutes a night and they infuriatingly play Shake Milton, then you, you're screwed. Like, Maxi's value is in the dunny. And, and then if Simmons does come back or a trade happens, then it goes further down. So uh, you just watch that one. Much like Kyle Anderson and Malik Beasley, it looks like Buddy Hield might come off the bench in Sacramento. They have been um, starting different lineups. Bagley started one of them. I think Mo Harkless started the other one. And Heald comes off the bench behind Halliburton and Fox. That is clearly his best role, in my opinion. But he played like 34 minutes a night last year. So it's going to come down. Whether that's the 25 minutes a night he played when he last came off the bench two seasons ago, or if it's like a 28 to 30 minute a night role, I'm not sure. But Heald going, and I talked about this yesterday in the Do Not Draft video, healed going at like, you know, pick 70 or 74 or whatever, makes not a lot of sense to me, given his you know, likely likelihood to drop down some minutes. And then in Toronto, like obviously Siakam is out, Boucher is out, Ken Birch hasn't played, but it, it, I think there's a legitimate chance that the opening night starting front court is Scotty Barnes and Precious Achua. There's going to be no Siakam or Boucher for opening nights. I think Barnes is going to lock in as the starting power forward. Early on, he's not going to maintain that role over Pascal Siakam later on, so don't get that confused. But Barnes will have that role initially, and I think there is a chance that they do start Achua as the starting center. Birch is no, like, it's not like, man, we have to make sure we get minutes for Ken Birch. Like, Ken Birch is totally fine as a below or, yeah, as a replacement level starting center. He's just, you know, if you line up all the starting centers, he's probably the 30th best starting center in the NBA. So, it's not like he has that position absolutely on lock. And if Achua is showing enough where they go, well, let's see what happens. There's a chance that he starts there. I don't particularly think that Precious is a great player, but Birch is, what, 30 years old and has got absolutely no upside in my opinion. He's probably better suited to being a backup. So just watch that one. We Again, we haven't seen Birch in the preseason, so we don't know, but I'll be interested to see um, exactly what happens there in that scenario and, and what they end up doing with Achua and whether they play him. College football currently on at the moment. The NFL on tomorrow. Football is in full swing. And the number one place to go and place your bets for football is at Bet Online with a new updated site and interface and more odds, props, and contests. Bet Online continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today. And if you use our promo code locked on, you get a 50% welcome bonus for first deposits. So from football, basketball, boxing, or even your favorite Vegas casino games, Bet Online has everything for you to take advantage of all their amazing offers for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online is where the game starts. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. That is not hyperbole. That is actually just true. It's unbelievable. It's the best tasting protein bar I've ever had. So many great flavors. Raspberry, cookies and cream, strawberry, orange, mint brownie, salted caramel, plus all the special edition ones they throw out there. It's just fantastic. But it's not just that they're delicious. They're also healthy. 17 to 18 grams of protein, 130 to 180 calories per bar, 4 to 5 grams of sugar, and 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. These bars are delicious, and they're also a good treat for you when you are looking to uh, look after your physique. So head to built.com, use our promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order of the best tasting protein bars ever. So built.com, promo code is LOCKED15. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. All right. 
Let's look at some big performers now across the preseason. We've got to start with Jordan Poole, who's averaging 25 points per game over his three games. He's hitting almost five threes. Now, yes, it's coming on 44% shooting from three and 67 from two. That's not going to stick. But he can be a 40% three-point shooter. In fact, I think he will be a 40% three-point shooter. He's going to start for the first two to three months of the season while Clay Thompson is out. He's probably going to play 33 minutes a night on those nights. And he is going to be a really, really interesting fantasy option for this season. He's got to be drafted. And I've been banging this drum forever. You have to draft him. Now, it's going to turn into a situation where he's going to end up going too high. People are going to start reaching into the 90s for him. And that might be a little bit too rich for me. But... Clay is going to miss games and be on a minutes limit for a long time. It's very easy to find. Well, you saw it in Sacramento last year. Tyrese Halliburton came off the bench, was able to get 29, 30 minutes every night. Yeah, Poole can do that while playing 33 minutes a night and the nights where Clay is out. Now, he's not the most diverse player, but he can handle the ball. He can get assists. He's averaging three and a half in preseason. He's averaging 1.3 steals. He's getting to the line. If he was... Let's throw it this way. If Jordan Poole was to come out of nowhere and be a top 50 player this year, I wouldn't be shocked at all. I'd take him over the other Jordan, Jordan Clarkson, in terms of draft spot, for sure. I think he's I think he's got much better fantasy potential. I don't buy this level of shooting, but he is a really good shooter. And he's showing an ability to be a high usage player, 34% usage. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about what he can do. Just watch you don't go too high. Like If you're taking him at 70, you're probably cutting off all value. If you've got to take him at 105, I, I don't actually think that's bad. I reckon there might be some value in that. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what he can do because the preseason is not only lining up with my expectations, but it's far exceeding what I thought that he'd be able to do. I was pretty high on him, but I obviously, you know, if, if I expected this, I can't come out there and say, here are my projections. Jordan Poole is a top 50 player because that's irresponsible, right? But it's not crazy for him to get there. But I can't project that, but I, I'm pretty excited. But what about Scarf? OG. Stop Wugs. OG. Uh, you better stop OG. Uh, OG Ananobi, the Jedi. He looks really good, doesn't he? And this is something we've talked about all offseason, that they are going to put the ball in his hands more, and they're going to increase his usage. And they did it at the end of last season, and it didn't impact his efficiency. And they've done it this preseason, and it hasn't impacted his efficiency. He's been great. The worry that I sometimes have with players, when you see that with, the, say, a Shea Gildas-Alexander, or even a Yanni to some degree, is that when you do get an increase in usage, some of your defensive stats can drop. So just watch that with Ananobi. But as a guy you know, in the third round, end of the third round, fourth round player, I, I really love him. If he's in the 50s, that's, that's ridiculous. He looks great. And even the other day, he had this great offensive night, and he still had four assists and four steals. It's, I don't trust the four steals as a re regular thing, obviously. And yeah, going from 1.5 steals to 1.2 or 1.3, I think is a possibility for OG. But much like saying Jordan Poole could be a top 50 player, OG could be a top 20 player. You know, I've been big on OG for a long time. I was roasted years ago for saying I think he's a better prospect than Pascal Siakam. I actually, you know, I said, well, maybe I was wrong. I'm going back. All right, I, I, I think it's true. I, I think he's going to be a better player than Siakam, but you can disagree with that as much as you want. He's been great. Um, Tyler Hero has been really good. Another guy that the hype was too high last year. And then you know when the rankings came out on pre on sites this year, it was like 170. Go, that's too low. You got to look at him as a last round guy. He's probably pushing a little bit too high now. He's averaging 25 points across three games on you know, extraordinarily high usage, 32%, and a true shooting of 68, which is going to fall. Like, he's not going to maintain that. But as a, a source of points and threes and assists, and coming off the bench with Struess and Gabe Vincent, he's going to get tons of opportunities. Now, he is a really, really good late-round pick. Steven Adams has been impressive too. He's averaging 13 boards in, in 23 minutes across two games. Interestingly, he's hitting 86% from the free throw line and 77 from the field. Now, that that is obviously improving his value. The rebounds are nice, but I'm, I'm not ready to buy in on those percentages being real. If you can get, you can get back to 70 from the field, sure, but 86, I, I don't know about it. But he's at least now, he was a guy I wasn't even considering as a draftable guy. I didn't know how much they'd play him. I still don't know how much they'll play him. But if he can be this productive on a permanent basis, then as a last pick, second last pick, I think it's totally fine. But there is a little bit of fool's gold, perhaps, in that free throw percentage. I've been impressed by Isaiah Joe in Philadelphia. I hope they find a way to give him rotation minutes. I would play him over Shake Milton personally, but I've been really impressed with him. Still needs a bit of work on his ball handling, but the shooting and the shooting um, or the... 
the the non reluctance. I don't know what word I'm trying to do. The um, yeah, he wants to shoot. That's, sim- that's what it is. And I think he's looked pretty good out there. So he's an interesting name for deeper leagues there. I think Lonzo Balls looked fantastic in Chicago. In fact, the Bulls have just looked amazing. DeMar DeRozan playing power forward, which, to be honest, I'll say it quietly, I think it's his best position. Um, he's playing there with Patrick Williams out, and they're starting Javonte Green. DeRozan's playing a lower usage facilitating type role. Lonzo looks awesome offensively and defensively. Levine looks fine. Yeah, Vooch is dropping back a little bit, but they look pretty good. And then Patrick Williams is going to slide into that Javante Green role. Alex Crusoe also looks good in Chicago. He's going to have an elevated role as long as Williams is out. He probably plays 24 minutes a night. I wouldn't worry about drafting Caruso, but you know there is something there for him. But when Williams comes back and then White trickles back in, it's probably going to cut off a little bit of that Alex Caruso value. I think in, in Milwaukee, Jordan War has looked really, really good. Uh, he's a guy that I, I talked up a lot after Summer League and the Olympics. Hopefully, he gets that role over Rocket Rodney Hood. And there is an opening with Dante DiVincenzo being out. This is only for deeper leagues, but I, I do think that he can find a regular rotation role and be a very interesting, um, a very interesting bench uh, bench scorer for this team because yeah, they, they need that sort of uh, opportunity. Let's look at some other guys. Really love Bones Highland. I thought it was a steal where he went in the draft. I don't remember exactly where I had him on my NBA draft board. I'll uh, see if I can find it, but I had him much higher than where he ended up going to Denver. In that spot, let's go and have a look where I had him. Um, duh, duh, duh. I had Bonesy up at 17. There you go. Uh, so yeah, I had him a lot higher than where he actually went. Um, and he's looked great. Like I think he's looked better than... He went at actually 26 in the draft. I think he's looked even better than, than picking him at 17. I had him in tier five of my dynasty rookies. Um, which was at about number you know, 12 or 13. Might even bump that up a little bit higher. There is a rotation spot here for him. There's no Jamal Murray, so they're probably going to start Barton and Morris. And then it's Faku and Austin Rivers there. Now, he can easily take both of those guys or one of those guys' roles. There's PJ Dozier as well, but he's more of a 2-3 than a 1-2. Than a and honestly, if Bones Highland started at some point really soon for this team, Monty Morris is fine, but there's no scoring punch there. Bones is just electric as a scorer. He's going to have defensive foibles for sure, but he's a hard worker. He's improved a ton already. I, I, if you want, if you just want an f- absolute flyer on someone, last round, go for it. Because if Malone comes out and goes, well, I, I can't. Like, I can't not play this level of offense. And he starts out getting 23 minutes a night off the bench. In a week's time, he might be starting and playing 30. Again, it's hyperbolic. I'm not projecting that. I'm not telling you to buy into that. And if someone wants to take him in round 10, I think they're being stupid. But in round 13, yeah, take him and have a look. Same goes with Trey Murphy, who's looked awesome. Another guy that I was a little bit higher on in the draft, I had him at, where did I have Trey Murphy? At 14 in my draft. So three, three spots higher than where he went. Um, he's looked great. And I think there's a real chance that he starts for the Pelicans. Regardless, he's going to have a big role. The problem you have is that when Zion and Ingram uh, are there and Alexander Walker and you know, whatever they do with Graham, look, the minutes are probably going to be a little bit squishy in terms of how much he can actually play. Um, he's been great. 19 points per game, five threes a game, hitting those at obviously 58%, a number which cannot stick. Now, he's hitting 20% of his twos, so there's some obvious room for that to change. He's not he's rebounding well, but not doing anything else, which is a little bit of a worry for his value. I think Bones probably has the higher fantasy upside as a last pick, but Trey is pushing into that mix. But there is you know, the fact that um, your Zion still has to come back and Ingram's got to play as to where he fits. It doesn't appear that Josh Hart is going to be a gigantic piece of this rotation for the Pelicans. Um, you're yeah, not going to get that 29 minutes a night, with my guess, with Marshall and Murphy you know, pushing into that role there too. And Alexander Walker's look great also. Whether he starts or comes off the bench, I'd like him to start, but it doesn't you know, have a gigantic impact. I'm still liking picking him in that, let's say, 75 to 95 range in that area of a draft. He'll be a high scorer. He'll hit threes. He's generating steals again. He is going to hurt your field goals. I don't think there's any way you can get around that. I like the fact that he's getting to the line quite a bit in preseason. That's impressive there too. We've only seen one game from Josh Giddy, but it was great. And you, you know I've had Giddy as my last round pick guy for a long time. That's not going to happen anymore. And I've been reaching up to around 100 to get him. And again, I think that's fine. He's going to start. He's going to play 30 minutes. He might average seven assists and seven rebounds. He might only average 10 or 11 points, but he's going to get big assists and big um, rebound numbers. And it's really valuable to get that late. 
I think Mo Bumba's looked pretty solid as well. I still believe Wendell Carter's the better overall player, but again, if they split minutes, and it is looking more towards that, Bumba is the better fantasy option. So if you're getting him in round 10, round 11, I think that's absolutely no problem to consider that an option there for uh, for Big Mo Bumba. I've got Stephen Adams there. I don't know why I put him on twice. Alex Caruso, I've mentioned him already. I think he looked... Um, yeah, pretty solid in the minutes that he's played. I think there's a it's a little fool's goldy. I don't really look at him as a 12-team draftable player. But he is and remains an excellent NBA player, as he was with the Lakers, um, one of the best defenders in the NBA. He's taken a little bit up offensively. I'm just not sure it's going to translate to fantasy. And then James Booknight, we have to mention him. He's looked good. Like He's scored at a really, a really good level, 18, 19 points per game across his two games. He's averaging two steals. He's shooting the ball well. Not from deep. He's not a good three-point shooter, 29% there. But there's just not going to be, I don't think, the opportunities for him to do that. Because you're going to have Ish Smith, um, Rogier, Lamello Ball, you know, Book Knight. They're your four guards. So this is not going to be enough room to push up into a larger role, plus Ubre. And Ubre has been missing in this preseason too. So while he's been good, like you know, Murphy and Highland as, as rookies, they're probably guys that I'm going to prefer uh, over him. Injuries. Trevor Ariza with that ankle problem, he's going to be out eight weeks or minimum eight weeks. So that's a long time. Yeah, that, that does help guys like Monk uh, and Kent Bazemore get a bit of a boost. And yeah, Bazemore becomes more of a 14-team sort of option. And Monk, maybe you look at a 12-team flyer. Boucher is going to miss the beginning of the season after surgery on his finger. As I said earlier, that helps Scotty Barnes become a nice late-round pick. It helps um, Precious Achua. It probably helps Ken Birch a little bit. Also, um, Kyrie Irving remains unvaccinated. It appears he's not getting vaccinated anytime soon. So I'm not touching him inside the top 50 of a draft. He is allowed to practice with the team now because that is considered a private facility, but he cannot play games at home uh, or at Madison Square Garden. John Kaminga has a slight knee injury. He may not be ready for opening night. I'm not convinced he'd play anyway. Otto Porter's looked great there. Jalen Brown has tested positive for COVID. He was vaccinated, so there's a chance he can still play on opening night, but just keep an eye on that. This should not impact your draft evaluation of Jalen Brown. Kelly Oubre, sprained ankle. I, I wouldn't, I wasn't going to be drafting Kelly Oubre anyway, um, but obviously, you know, we're not seeing him in preseason and how that works out, so I'm off that. Will Barton, I still like him as a late pick, but another ankle injury for him. That's enabling guys like PJ Dozier and Bones Highland to really establish themselves and ingratiate themselves with Michael Malone. So, well, I still like Barton. I think he's still going to get that op- opportunity. Um, I'm souring somewhat there. And we haven't seen Cade Cunningham yet with his ankle. He should be right for opening night, but we just haven't seen it yet. Jackson Hayes also has an ankle injury. That's just going to push Bill Hernan Gomez into that backup role. So for deeper leagues, yeah, he can be an interesting option. Hayes, I think, is someone to watch to see what role they end up giving him as the season goes on. But nothing too exciting there. Trim Rakiki is dealing with a hip problem. There's obviously a massive opening for him with John Isaac out. And Isaac had an appearance on a podcast talking about his injury, saying, well, he thinks he's ready for opening night, but yeah, a return closer to Christmas is probably more likely from the team's point of view, which is unbelievably wild to me that he would be out for 16 months after an ACL injury. Like, unbelievable. Um, it's If that is true, it's really hard to, to draft him because he's going to be limited all season. I, I'm pretty sure. Matisse Thibel's dealing with a shoulder problem. We know Thibel's a great steals and blocks option. Nothing else but a good steals and blocks option, and that can be useful. And then Norman Powell is also dealing with a hip issue at, at the moment. Uh, again, don't think that's going to cause any long-term concern for him. All right, that'll cover it for everything uh, for the preseason that I've seen so far. So some definite in- interesting takeaways. You know, the Heald and Graham and Beasley and Kyle Anderson off the bench, the big pool and Highland and Giddy and Trey Murphy and Alexander Walker performances are something to pay attention to. Stephen Adams' renaissance is really interesting. And we'll see what happens over the next couple of days. I am going to be doing, um, due to popular demand, which is not popular because, again, points leagues are the minority of my uh, followers, but... I'm, st- I'm trying to cater to you guys as well. So I'm going to do a must draft player and a do not draft player video for points leagues coming up. Stay tuned for that. And remember, next week, Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern, the live fantasy basketball Ask Us Anything with myself, a bunch of fantasy analysts, hosts across the Locked On Podcast Network, any other names of basketball people that I can try and drag in to have a chat about things, to answer 
your questions. So get questions prepared. Um, last time I did this before the season, we just got absolutely smashed with questions. So I can't get to, to everybody. We try and get to as many as possible. Um, we do prioritize the, the people who throw super chats in there as well. So just get your questions ready. It'll be like it'll be like doing a Reddit AMA, but doing it live and you get to hear me talk about the answers instead of talk, uh, typing them out. Guys, that'll do it for us here. So follow Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app while on YouTube. Hit thumbs up, leave your comments down below, subscribe, share, ring a notification bell. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.